Hello, beautiful hearts. I pray that all is well with each and every one of you on this Wednesday afternoon. I pray that you're winning your season like a champion and gaining victory over the devil in every area of your life. I thank you so much for joining today's broadcast, which is part two, Awake Out of Your Sleep. On Tuesday, I taught on on part one, wake up and becoming active. So I pray that you took a lot of notes and that you did some studying and researching the scripture and taking some of those reflection points and asking God questions, which allows you to seek him, chase him and pursue him for the answer. I pray that also that you took what you learned and then put it in a place of prayer. But today we are on part two, Awake Out of Your Sleep. God is setting things right. God is setting things right. So go ahead, grab your Bible as well as your journal and a pen. And if it's this, if this is your first time joining a broadcast of Keisha L. Cephas, welcome to you. Take some time to subscribe and also take some time to turn on the notifications. So that way, when I come on live on Mondays and Fridays at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, along with Wednesdays, at 12 p.m. Central Standard Time, you'll be notified to join in as well. Also, join the community. Uh, the community is where you will find events, updates, and any of my fasting challenges or my goodbye challenge that I believe that I'll be bringing back really, really soon. Also, I'm hosting a prayer gathering here in Chicago, Illinois on Tuesday, February 28th at 7 p.m. Central, Central Standard Time. If you are a subscriber, you'll be able to find the event bright link for you to get your ticket. Now, we only have a couple of tickets left. Over 440 some people have joined. I found favor where we were able to add more seating so that way I can host more intercessors for this night of prayer. So go ahead and go right over to the community after this broadcast, click the link, and then you'll be able to secure a ticket as long as tickets are available. Once registration closes, then it means that we have reached the sanctuary capacity, and then we'll probably have to just see you next month, all right? But now it's time to get started with today's teaching, all right? Which is God has set things right. God has set things right, all right? And I want you to turn your Bible to Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 24. Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 24. All right. And this is the message Bible. The message Bible. Are we ready? All right. Now, you know that you can still engage in the comments. I get the chance to read them later. So please engage in the comments so I can see your thoughts, hear you, and then I may be able to also respond as well. All right. Thank you. All right. Here we go. Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 24, the message Bible says, But in our time, something new has been added. What Moses and the prophets witnessed to all those years has happened. God setting things right. That we read about has become Jesus setting things right for us. And not only for us, but for everyone who believes in him. For there is no difference between them and this, since we've compiled this long and sorry record as sinners, both, both us and them, and provided that we are utterly incapable of living this glorious lives, living the glorious lives God wills for us. God did it for us. Out of sheer generosity, he put us in right standings with himself, a pure gift. He got us out of the mess we're in and restored us to where he always wanted us to be. And he did it by means of his son, Jesus Christ. And what I love is out of the midst of our mess, out of the midst of darkness, this God this great God, this loving and compassionate and sovereign God said, you know what, though you might be a mess, I am going to give you my best gift, my only begotten son who will die for your mess, die for your sins, die for the dirt, whatever this is that is in you. 
that I will place my best gift on a cross that he may die that you may live. This same God who was risen on the third day, Jesus Christ himself, risen on the third day that we may have salvation. And no matter what today may appear to be or what it may feels like, we still have a God that sees. And you may think I've messed up or it's too late or, you know, I've been saying too, like, this is the same God that looks at us in our dirtiest state um, from the dust of the ground who breathes his Ruach into us, right? Because he's Ruach Elohim, the same God who breathes his life, his spirit, his breath into us. He makes us a living soul. He knew that we would times backslide. And he even said, I am married to the backslider. The same God that says, I am generous. I am going to give my best gift to you. And I am going to bring you and have you reconcile to me. I am going to uh, create, uh, create you in my image and in my likeness. This God. This is why I say there's nothing that we have done or can do to make our God change, right? So let's go ahead and get started with my first reflection point. I don't care how bad it is. I don't care. Even if it's a loved one, there's nothing too hard for God. There's no one that he cannot save. So I, I just love the fact that I know where I came from and I know exactly how much darkness I was. No, I probably know he can't even measure the type of darkness I was in, but yet this God loved me so much in my times of depression, uh, suicidal thoughts, when I was smoking weed, drinking, doing full of perversion, looking for love in all the wrong places. And yet he saw fit and I wear none of it. I wear none of it. Uh, the only way that you would know uh, what I've come out of is based off of me giving my testimony because he has truly made all things new. And I'm not talking about my hands and my feet too. I'm just talking about my mind, my spirit, my soul, um, even just with my body, like how I, I treat it. And, and and all these things are new, right? All of these things are new. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away and behold, all things have become new. All right, so let's get into my first reflection point of today. Are you ready? All right, perfect. Both groups slumbered and slept. Even in the most dedicated and sincere saints may temporarily become spiritually lethargic. The fact that the bridegroom delayed his coming in one of Jesus, many hints that his return may be much later than expected. From the perspective of the first century church, Christ has delayed for almost 2,000 years. Nevertheless, we should not allow ourselves to become lethargic about his eventual return, according to Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 3. The word slumbered is actually to nod. It is trans, transcendent act, whereas slept, all right, which should be also known as sleeping. And it is a continuous act. Thus, we, thus we see the progression of being lethargic. First, the virgins nodded, which we learned in part one, nodded their heads as if napping, and later they slept continuously and deeply. Initial weariness is the first step to further spiritual decay. Write it down. Initial weariness is the first step to further spiritual decay. It is vital to catch temporary apathy early to prevent, write it down, disillusionment. All right. It is vital to catch temporary apathy early to prevent permanent disillusion. I also say, I know when something is vying for my attention, other than God, I can tell when um, something is going on in my soul because these are the very things that try to pull me away from prayer, from my study time, which is part of devotion. Um, also, I can tell when my judgments are being cloudy. Um, one of the things that I have been praying about 
over a period of time and I went on a fast for it was God restored my enthusiasm back from ministry, like all things ministry, all things kingdom, my zeal. I never lost my knowledge. I just, it was the enthusiasm of it all because you can be in church for so long and you can get the rhythm of it, the sound of it, the language of it. And you start finding yourself just doing works. And I no longer wanted to just be doing works. I wanted to build relationships, not just with God by himself, but with people. And when you go through hard seasons in any part of your life where you've been impacted in a negative way with people, it tends to knock like this breath out of you. It's like this blow. I call it the trauma of or blow of life because it can be traumatic. And I just was honest with God that um, I never want to become lethargic or allow apathy to set in to the place where now I feel like I'm sleeping on my watch, especially being called a watchman. And I never want to be asleep on my post. And I never want to mistreat this relationship that I have with the father. Um, spending just enough time just to say I spent time. I want to enjoy spending time um, worshiping. I want to be enjoy times of prayer and intercession. I want to enjoy just sitting to get to know him through revelation. Because the revealer is in the midst of me. I just want to build up something that is not super superficial or shallow and that um sometimes um when we lose our zeal we don't want to read our bible or read books to help with our growth and development in any area of life we don't want to be around people we start to isolate ourselves and become prisoners of our own minds and we start to um, then start the enemy start beating us up with condemnation and shame and it just goes on and on and on and if we keep down that road then you'll start to see how you lose a part of yourself if that makes sense um and these are the things that I talk to God about is I don't want to lose myself. I don't want to be asleep or, or just like sleepwalking, right? Um, you, 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 you're asleep, but you're moving, but you're not as wake as awake as you need to be, or you know, woke, right? And um, it's like walking with your eyes open but see nothing. I don't want to be like that. Um, the Bible talks about many wish they can see what we see today and hear what we hear today. And I just want to make sure that I build uh, the proper relationship, not just with God, but with people, but have some enthusiasm about it, some zeal about it, if that makes sense. All right. So I want you to turn your Bible to uh, Habakkuk chapter two, and I want us to read chapter three, Habakkuk chapter two, and let's read verse chapter three, all right? For the vision is yet for an appointed time and it hastens to end fulfillment. It will not deceive or disappoint. Though it tarry, wait earnestly for it because it will surely come. It will not be behind hand or on its appointed day. Um, also, if you look, take some time to look at Habakkuk chapter 2 and verses 1, 2, 3, and 4, then you'll also see like us being watchmen and how we stand upon our posts, right? And though it appears that what we're seeing, the enemy is, it looks like he's gaining an advantage, right? We can see everything that he's doing, but then on this post, on this watchtower, uh, this high place, God is like, hey, if you want to know what I'm doing, you can't stay down here. If you want to know what I'm doing, you need prophetic insight. If you want to know what I'm doing, you need clarity and you need the right heart. You need to come up. You need to soar. And though you may be able to see what the enemy is doing, you still need to know how I am advancing the kingdom of God through you. And though you may have uh, a complaint or you might feel like you want to murmur, don't do it down here. 
Don't go to my creation. Come to me. Uh, make the, the complaint from within to me. And then I want you to learn how to wait on me and hear what I have to say about the matter. And when you come down, you'll have prophetic insight. And then you'll be able to write down what I said to you, but you'll also become what I said. And then when people look upon you, that's how they run with what they see because of what you are becoming or what you have be you what you are becoming or have became in those moments and they run with it with what their time their treasure their resources and they're like divine connectors they are like doors that God uses um to fulfill what he has shown and in those moments it looks like things are being held up it looks like it's it's tearing right but he says listen you know when you have prophetic insight you're not asleep your spirit is awake you like i don't have time my spirit is awake i'm alert right it says for the vision is yet for an appointed time and it hastens to the end fulfillment it will not deceive or disappoint though it tarry wait earnestly for it because it will surely come it will not be behind behind hand or it's appointed day all right here's my reflection point the 10 virgins service and reverence to god is done all right, they understand their their uh, function, right? It is more of a habit than a sincere zeal. And this is seen even in us as Christians, routine attendance and attendance at any given service. We know what to do. Of course, we know how to obey God almost mindlessly, developing it into a routine over time. But there are times when we lack emotion or emotional maturity and forethought carries them through life in lightheaded bliss. And so what happens is we remain with the church, just filling a seat or attending only occasionally. So we can become a number in a seat. I always say that, or a seat filler with a dollar sign on our forehead. We know exactly, we can predict what service is going to look like from the beginning to the end. We can predict even our exp our responses, amen, hallelujah, you're preaching today. And then we leave out, we leave out and nothing about our day changed, nothing about our life changed, nothing in our mind has changed, nothing has penetrated the heart. We just know on Sundays, uh, we go to church or Wednesday or Tuesday for a Bible class. If there's a special event, we have already prepped our day for that. We know how to go with the motions. But is anything changing? Are we really, are, are we awake? Or are we just going through the motions? All right? Write this down. When we are awakened out of our sleep, which is slumber... We begin our we begin to seek God. So our seek increases. All right. So when we are awakened out of our sleep, which is slumber, our seek for God increases. When we are awakened out of our sleep, which is our slumber, our seek for God increases. Then I want you to write down the word seek. Seek. I hope you're getting something so far. Seek. All right, here we go. Seek is defined as to resort to. It is also go to. It is to search in of. Also seek is defined as, according to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, as to look for, to try to discover. It is also to ask for. Seek is defined as to request, to try to acquire or gain. It is also to aim at, to aim at, all right? Seek is defined as to make an attempt or to be sought. To make an attempt or to be sought, all right? So seek is defined as to resort to, go to, it is also to go search in of, it is to look for, 
to try to discover, to ask for. It is also to request. It is to try to acquire or gain, to aim at, to make an attempt, or to be sought. Here are the synonyms for seek. Ready? Here we go. The synonyms for seek is cast about. Cast about. But it's also cast around. The synonyms also for seek is chase down. Hunt. It is to look up, pursue, quest, and search for. All right? Synonyms for seek is cast out, cast around, chase down, hunt, look up, pursue, quest, and to search for. If you also look up seek, it also talks about presence. And when you see the word presence, you also would connect that to face. So we're chasing God. We're pursuing God. We're making a request. We are inquiring of him. When you are awake, the seek increases. See, this is not just a natural way of being awake. This is spiritually being awakened, right? It is, God, I need you. God, I'm chasing you. God, I have questions. I need answers. I have a problem. I need your solution. There are times when I'm not able to open up my mouth, but yet I can feel your grace comes into a room. I don't have to role play. I don't have to put on no mask. I don't have to come with a whole list. You know me. I don't have to beg you because I am a child. I am a son. I know you know me. And so your, your pursuit of him, it increases. The seek increases. Now imagine when it says in the presence of the Lord, there's the fullness of joy, right? That's the Bible. And think about if you're seeking and you're in his presence and now there's the fullness of joy, then joy has to increase when you're in his presence, right? Peace has to increase when we're in his presence, right? Strength has to increase when we're in his presence. Think about revelation has to increase when we're in his presence. Our discernment increase when we're in his presence. Why? We can discern between that which is good and evil, that which is true, and yet that which is false, yet which is holy, and yet profane or wicked. Our hunger increases when we are in seek mode. So start to think about that. So when the enemy is trying to put us to sleep, put us in slumber, then he knows that it decreases our seek of God. All right. And listen to this song of Solomon chapter three. You can turn there verses uh, one through five. Song of Solomon chapter three verses one two, three, four, and five. All right. Here we go. In the night, I dreamed that I sought the one whom I love. She said, I looked for him, but could not find him. So I decided to go out into the city, into the streets, broadways, which are so confusing to a country girl and seek him whom my soul loves. I sought him, but I could not find him. The watchman, Verse three, who go about the city found me to whom I said, have you seen him whom my soul loves? For I had gone but a little way past them when I found him whom my soul loves. I held him and would not let him go until I had brought him into my mother's house and into the chamber of her who conceived me. Five, I adjure you. O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles, or by the hinds of the field, that you stir not up nor awaken love until it pleases. Reflection point. This first dream of sequence shows the Shulamite in bed. Read the whole story. And even in her dream, she seeks the beloved. That's verse one. Her love for him is so consuming that she constantly looks for him everywhere. And it says, when she awakens in the dead of the night, she goes out into the city to look for him. That's verse two. She goes down every street into every square without finding him. She asks 
the policemen strolling their beats if they have seen him. Verse 5. But when they give her no help, she continues anyway to search and immediately finds him. That's verse 4. She is overjoyed, so overjoyed, and so fearful of losing him again that she clutches him tightly and refuses to let him go until she brings him back to her mother's house where they will be married. Since her relationship with the beloved is so wonderful, she advises the other young women to make certain that they are truly ready for the experience before they commit to the relationship of their own. That's verse five. And you'll also read it in Luke chapter 14, verse 26 through 33. Here it is. I'm seeking you. I'm chasing you. I'm pursuing you. And when I feel like I'm unable to find you, I keep pursuing you. That's like being in a place of prayer. Have you ever been in prayer and it seemed like sometimes you are lost for words? You're like, God, I don't even know what to talk about. I, I mean, I can come in here with a list, but even that's not going right. Or you praying and it feels like it's going nowhere. And you're like, this is just like... Am I praying amiss? Is something wrong with me, God? I mean, because yesterday I was praying with fire and today I feel like nothing is burning inside of me. Or you're like, I remember when I used to pray for long lengths of time and I remember when I was on fire for God and I remember how I used to stay in prayer for three hours, two hours, one hour. But God, today I just have nothing. Those are the times that you need to keep chasing him, keep pursuing him, keep seeking him. You in covenant with him. You in a legal binding agreement with the father. If this man, God himself says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Then we have to believe that he'll never leave nor forsake. And it's not about just our feelings. See, there we go again, knowing how to go with the motion. But this is about a relationship that was birthed out of intimacy. This is, I'm not trying to lose this. I'm not trying to be disconnected from my source. I don't want to be in a broken relationship with him. So I'm going to hold on tight. Even when it feels like he may not be present, I know he's here. <laughs> I love to be in your presence. I love to commune with you. I was born to commune with you, right? All right, let's, let's move on. But did you get something out of that? That's a powerful story. It is. It's a powerful story. And that was coming out of Song of Solomon, chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. But look at Luke chapter 14. I got a few minutes left, y'all. I'm, I'm trying to be a good girl, okay? Luke chapter 14, verse 26 through 30. Okay, because I can teach actually for hours, but I have to put a cap on it so I'll, I won't burn myself out. Okay, Luke chapter 14, verses 26 through 30. People who love you tell you, yeah, you need a limit. You need boundaries, all right? Luke chapter 14, 26 through 30 says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother in sense of indifference to or relative disregard for them in comparison with his attitude toward God, and likewise, his wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. This Amplified Classic. 27, whoever does not persevere and carry his own cross and come after me, follow me, cannot be my disciples. 28, for which of you wishing to build a farm building does not first sit down and count and calculate the cost to see whether he has sufficient means to finish it. 29, otherwise, when he has laid the foundation and is unable to complete the building, all who see it will begin to mock and jeer at him. 30, saying this man began to build and was not able to, able or worth enough to finish meaning count the cost right and when you're asleep and trying to build a relationship or build anything we all got to sit down and count the cost but we need to consider consider we got to take up our own cross and pursue him nothing comes before him nothing is more important than him 
Though we think it could be our job, because that's vying for our attention, career, education, children, spouses, siblings, parents, money even vies for our attention. But we have to lay all these things down, deny all these things, because in him, we can have all these things, right? The God that knows everything we need, the God who knows us. But this is all about pursuit. This is all about seek. This is also about self-denial. <gasps> Write it down. Self-denial. Even denying this flesh who never gets enough. Never gets enough. Killing it. Saying, I'm going to pursue my lover, my maker, Jehovah, Abba, my father. I'm going to... I will pursue my deliverer, my healer, my peace. This is who I choose to pursue. So I got to be awake. I don't have time to slumber in my spirit. Because if I'm doing that, surely I end up in my flesh. And you said to kill the flesh daily, God. You said there's no good thing that dwells in the flesh. That it profits me nothing to operate in this flesh. I choose you. All right? And the flesh is a stench unto his nostrils. A stench. All right? Here we go. Here's my reflection point. And I'm wrapping up. I promise. What an incredible prophecy of the church of God today. Part of the church woke up from slumber with the strength and commitment to seek the bridegroom high and low. These people were strong enough to overcome and pass by the problems they encountered out in the world. Because surely, when we're in the flesh, we will definitely become carnal. We'll become worldly, all right? And to be a friend of the world is to be an enemy of God. Before he had to knock on the door in judgment, each one of these Christians, Christ-like, Christ-minded, found Christ again and refused to let him go. They will not allow a separation to occur in this relationship in this marriage again. Unfortunately, there will be others have awakened more slowly with much less strength with little to no resolve. So the quicker we awake out of our sleep, out of our slumber, getting out of this mess and deciding to pursue God, maybe you feeling like, is it too late? Am I behind time? Have I messed up so much that God is angry with me? God's judgments are good towards us. And yes, he chastens those he loves. But his love is unconditional, unfailing, and he keeps no track record of wrong when we repent. Having a change of heart, a change of mind, a change of way, a change of conduct. He's a loving God. He's not to be compared to no man on earth ever, in earth ever. So it's not too late to pursue him. It's not too late to chase him. It's not too late to seek him. It's not too late to inquire of him. It's not too late to say, you know what? I'll start where I'm at because I know he'll meet me right there. It's not too late. It's not. Let the fire burn in you again. And let this fire be set ablaze once again. Not that you choosing to chase an old flame. No. You're getting to know him, God himself, in a different way. But also you're discovering you in ways you never knew. You'll also find if I know Jesus the way I know him, you'll discover within you that you're stronger than what you think you are. Let him bring a, about a resolve today. Let him awaken you out of your sleep if you feel like, I feel so disconnected right now. You don't have to be like this. That's my Nigerian old coming out, okay? But God loves you. And he wants you awakened out of your sleep so you can chase him again. 
pursue him again. Love on him again. Get in your rightful place again. Find peace again. Find your joy in him again. Kill your flesh again. Okay. So that's part two. All right. God wants to set things right. And I'm going to go with God is setting things right in your life today. I pray that you enjoyed this broadcast, this teaching of part two, Awake Out of Your Sleep. All right. So we have part one, type it in, waking up and becoming active. Then we have part two. All right. Which is God wants to set things right. Now, on Friday at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, we'll have Awake and Stir Yourself Before It's Too Late. Awake and Stir Yourself Before It's Too Late. All right. I'll see you on Friday at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. I pray that this teaching was a blessing to you. Keep in mind, if this is your first time joining the Keisha L. Cephas YouTube broadcast live, or if you're catching a replay, go ahead and subscribe today and turn on your notifications so that way you can be notified when I come on live. Also, take some time to join the community for events and updates along with any challenges that I may launch, such as a fasting challenge. Love those. All right, friend, fasting challenges are the best. Sometimes I do seven days. Sometimes I do 30, uh, 21 days and I have done 30 days. Oh, no, I did a 40 day too. Ah, talk about it again, God. Talk about it again. All right. So I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. Listen, make sure you comment and let me know what point stood out to you, what point impacted you the most, and then we can build from there. Until then, see you Friday at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. And also, if you have yet to get your ticket to God's Burning Ones Prayer Gathering being hosted here in Chicago, February 28th at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time with me being your lead or your leader in that on that day, Listen, go over to the community and grab your ticket before all of them are sold out. Found favor to add some more chairs. Uh, but once we have reached the sanctuary capacity, then you may have to just catch us the next time. All right. Until then, have a good, a good, good, good afternoon. Pray for me as I pray for you. Bye-bye.